So it didn't even come into my option list, but you know, that's yeah. just me. Good afternoon and welcome. And uh, welcome to the CanVT's Mountain View Art and Wine Festival coverage for 2013. We're here today testing mics. Good. There we go. All right, Teresa, your turn. Okay. Well, it's a beautiful day here. It's, it's Good afternoon and welcome to KMVT's live coverage of the 2013 Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. I'm your host today, Chris Pareja. You'll normally find me on KMVT a couple of times a month on the right side, the show where we talk about today's conservative issues, trends, and, uh, and issues of the day. But I'm joined this afternoon by my co-host, Teresa Condon, who you may have also seen on KMVT's show, What the Bleep. We're going to be talking a little bit about today about what we're seeing out here at the festival. We'll have a number of guests we'll be interviewing, but the first things first, Teresa, have you had a chance to roam around? Yes, I have, Chris, and I have to say, I think this year's Mountain View Art and Wine Festival is even better than last year, if that was possible. I've seen lots of great artists here, there's concerts going on, dance performances, so if you haven't had a chance to stop by yet this weekend, please do. This really is a situation where there's something for all of the senses, right? There's something yes. for sight, smell, sound, taste. They probably prefer that you ask before touching, but overall, yes. if you need something inside your house, outside your house, for the walls, for the children, it's pretty much here. Yes, and let's not forget the wine cellar as well. This is the Mountain View Art and Wine Fest Wine Festival, and there's a lot of great vineyards here, and so if, if you're looking for something to fill your wine cellar as well, this is the place to come. Yeah, it definitely is. And the, the, one of the things that people might be concerned about is parking, but I found that the parking is reasonable. You can get it even as low as $5 nearby in some of the parking lots. And if you pick the right parking lot, it's even a tax write-off. Makes it easy to get around. I did not know that. That's a great insider tip, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> That's educated laziness. I know that some people oh. might be stopping themselves from coming, saying, I don't know if it's going to be easy enough to park. It's not a problem. They should come on down anyway, right? Yeah, and don't forget your sunscreen or hats, because it is bright and sunny day here. I think it's supposed to be in the mid 80s today. So a little warm, but it's a perfect day for a festival. And don't let it stop you from shopping, right? Yes, never. <laughs> and so have you had a chance to figure out where you might be stopping after we're done today? 
<laughs> uh, yes, there's a lot of beautiful jewelry stands here. My favorite that I've seen so far, actually, there's a steampunk jewelry stand. It's a bit of a niche, but if, if that's the kind of thing you're into, that it's really beautiful pieces. Also, some of the uh, nature photography portraits, they're really beautiful. So, highly recommend checking those out if you're coming. Now some of the artisans have some extremely unique crafts that they've brought forward. I know my yes. stepdad, for example, is very interested in wood turning, and I've seen uh, oh. booths where they do everything from razors and pens all the way up to canes and, and larger pieces, so that's great from an artisan perspective. Some of the food smells really good, and yes. I've got to admit, I've got a guilty pleasure waiting for me across the street here with the bacon-wrapped hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Bacon wrapped hot dogs. Well, I think right after we wrap up, my first stop will be the lemonade stand. <laughs> they happen to have that too, Arnold Palmer style, so I think I might do a double oh, whammy. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a great <laughs> idea. Also, the, um, the there's roasted corn on the cob, which looks really great. That's a perfect summer treat. And the, the turkey legs actually down the street, you can see from perfect. about a block away. They're huge. <laughs> That's awesome. So we're going to be talking in a little while to some of the guests. We'll be talking mm -hmm. to the mayor of Mountain View soon. We'll be talking to other community members around from around the area. But what's interesting to me is how far some of these vendors have come. Some of them have right. come from Redding, which is about as far north in California as you can go. And in other cases, um, I've seen people come from further south. So definitely a place to go if people get a chance to stop by and visit us today and they can visit us right here on the corner of church and Castro if they wanted to see what we're doing and mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, get caught as they're walking by on camera hear that church and Castro um, well thank you very much for joining us for this introduction and uh, well let's go see what some people on the street have to say hi I'm Diane here at the wine and arts festival here in Mountain View and we are talking with a fabulous artist here. So um, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Okay, my name is Hector Valencia, and I'm out of Tucson, Arizona. And I do metal artwork, and most of my, all my stuff I get powder coated. And being from Tucson, I enjoy looking at glass. We have about 350 days of sun in Tucson, so I like incorporating glass into my work just fabulous. Um, I love how you thought of the idea of incorporating the sun, catching it so it can glisten and right. shimmer. Right. A lot, you know, people think of this as jewelry for the home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people like putting this out in their yard and uh, the wind turns it. It's kinetic art. Yeah. So, uh, again, I powder coat them and it's all metal. They, these things last for a very long time. Mm -hmm. what, what stone is this? This is gorgeous. This is actually not a stone. It's actually glass. Oh, it's yeah, glass. it's glass. It's solid glass, green glass that's come from a factory that this is like a spillover and it just becomes a slab. And so it gets cut, I break it into the, you know, a shape and then I'm able to work with it from there. You showcase it just beautifully. Really? Thank you, Great. thank you, thank you. So, and then you make some little things here. Little things too. People, people like uh, looking, you know, usually have uh, something that they want to give to a child or, or for their own home. Then mm -hmm. Again, it all reflects to the sun. Mm -hmm. You know, just all my stuff that goes outside, uh, goes out and, and just is able to work in order to make it glimmer. Okay. Well, thank you so much for oh, talking with me and good luck with your sales today. I appreciate it. appreciate the time you stopped by. Thank you. We're talking to Richard Vest, the wildlife artist at the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. Richard, how long have you been doing this and what made you get interested in the first place? Well, I've been uh, carving since 1978 and I grew up in San Francisco, so I'm a Bay Area guy. My dad had 12 salmon boats out of Fisherman's Wharf for 30 years, so that kind of got the sea part of me going. But I've developed a unique style which is um, hand carved and I've worked really well on sea life and animals for that long period of time and now I have a lot of collectors in the Bay Area. Well, your work is beautiful and it's so diversified. You have turtles and giraffes and every. Do you have a, any one type of wildlife that you prefer? Uh, it's actually the piece I'm working on but I, I'm really expanded out into all kinds of sea animals and uh, and uh, regular um, wild animals and for example a lot of people have African themes in their house so they might really be interested in the giraffes and the, the process of the way I do this is I'll photograph the animals in their natural habitat if I can 
I'll bring back the photos, do full-size drawings, and then from the drawing, I do the carving. That's why they're so real. And even though I get a lot of carvers that come into my booth and like the work, a lot of them don't have a good drawing background. It's the drawing married with the carving that's been the unique style for me for 30 years. It is just um, um, impressive. It's a wonderful. Did you study this or are you self-taught? I did. No, I went five years to San Francisco State Drawing and Sculpture Program, so I've got a really good foundation in that. And you can see it, you know, in the uh, pieces. So people are really discerning nowadays. They're really looking for high-quality work. There's a lot of good artists at this Mountain View show, and uh, they all have that bug, that that bug that they that uh, that attach to them to do artwork. So they just, uh, it's almost like a um, perpetual motion. That's great. Is this one of your favorite shows of it the year? Is. Yeah, this one, the Fremont and Los Altos are all really big shows for me. Although we do shows in Arizona, too, in oh. Tempe out there. You wouldn't believe how many people like sea life out in Arizona. They do. They must be homesick for water. That, that must be it, homesick <laughs> for water. Yeah. Well, this is just, which is your favorite piece? Or, you said um, the, one you're the, giraffes are, the giraffes are, the whole otter series is really popular. And, of course, all the turtles. Over here, the, all these uh, large um, sea turtles, which are endangered species. And I actually try to get a lot of endangered species, too, because people, uh, you know, are, uh, to get them interested in animals in general. So. And you notice you were explaining this turtle here to someone as, as we as we got here. Right, this is a really wonderful piece here. It took three and a half months on this turtle and uh, it started from a big block and then my wife watched this slowly come out of this block week after week. And now it's done and it's really neat to see something that's, a, you have an idea for something and then see it actually finished. It, to see that creative process is, is a wonderful process, it really is. Thank you so much, Richard. We'll look forward to seeing you for the rest of the week. And Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. I'm Chris Pareja, and again, my co-host is Teresa Condon. And right now, we're joined by the mayor of Mountain View, John Inks. John, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here, uh, Chris and Teresa. Well, th thanks for stopping by to spend a few minutes uh, with us. Now, we know that it's summertime, so things are probably a little bit quieter at the council chambers. Besides letting you out to the festival, what else is going on right now with that free time? Well, actually, uh, Chris, um, during the council break, uh, the number of community events actually spikes. And uh, so throughout the summer, there are any number of ceremonial events, openings, ribbon cuttings, community events, ice, ice cream socials, uh, picnics, everything. There are a lot of organizations to meet with, a multicultural city. You know, I welcome the Hare Krishnas who moved from San Jose to their new temple. The Iwata Exchange students moved here. There are restaurant openings. Um, a lot of things going on in the community with the Mountain View High School class. They opened up uh, new classrooms there. The Mayview Community Clinic. So you're really out about a lot including what I do normally, which is meeting with a lot of neighbors, uh, project applicants, and people that want to see the council on the regular, council members on a regular basis. Okay, great. So John, out of all the wonderful items for sale here at the festival, what's the, your favorite purchase that you've made? At one of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festivals. Well, the favorite purchase I happen to be wearing, which is a pewter bu belt buckle that um, I bought when I got my pilot's license back in uh, 2006. And uh, it's a really fancy piece of leather work and a rather heavy buckle, and I'm pretty proud of it. You know, really, that's probably the best that I've bought here of the scores of gifts I've bought for over so many years. Uh, and that, that's a great purchase, and obviously a lot of emotional uh, sentiment tied to it. But what's in the bag? What's in the bag? This happens to be my wine glass from my first Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. I moved here in 1975. So this glass is now 38 years, and the most remarkable thing about it is that I haven't broken it. So I keep this on, on my wine shelf very, very carefully. Well, I will do my best not to knock you over in my excitement. Is there anything else that you've seen today that might walk home with you as you leave? Uh, I could be tempted for some of the delicious food that is here. I don't know about buying anything, but I look around, I haven't had lunch yet. I may buy something. 
Well, if you're uh, not careful, depending on what you do buy at the food booth, there's some pretty good things, but they may be with you for a while. I'm very aware of that, Chris. <laughs> Great. So anything else you want to share with us about the happenings within Mountain View uh, while we still have a couple of minutes to spend with you? Uh, yes, uh, the council is actually back in session. Uh, we had a facilitator work session to improve uh, our processes, anything that we can do there. And there are a number of uh, development projects that are going to be coming through. So the council is uh, back in business and that's going to be keeping me tied up for the rest of the year. Any of those projects that the community should be aware of and might get excited about in a positive way? Uh, the community is already excited about some of them, in fact has talked to us about them. Some of the developments on El Camino Real, uh, some of the growth areas of the city, uh, you know, there's some challenges with change and intensification that uh, require careful uh, policy development. Great. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us, John, and um, let's go to the street and see what people have to say. I'm, this is Diane Sparks, and I'm going to be interviewing. Yeah, my name is Wu Bong Yi. Nice to meet you, and we stopped by your booth to, because we just love your work. It's beautiful. Can Thank you tell me about where you're from and um, about uh, how you started painting? Yeah, I'm from uh, San Bernardino, uh, Southern California. Oh, okay. And when did, yeah. when did you start working on your artwork? I work... Uh, my original born is uh, South Korea. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's an uh, art school, uh -huh. not here. Yes. I work uh, uh, over 35 years. Uh -huh. Your talent shows so beautifully. I love your colors. Um, what's your inspiration? Okay, what, um, where do you get like this, this idea oh, of this, ce this scene? Uh, my imagination. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Very beautiful. And so, um, I haven't seen you at the Wine and Arts Festival in previous years. Is this your first time here? No, I work a long time. Almost eight years. Oh, wow. Okay, we would just love to watch you paint for a few, uh, for a minute, okay? Thank, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you very much. <laughs> Look at the waterfall. Yeah. Oh. Look at that he did in layers. We're speaking with Beverly and Barbara of B and B Designs, and this is Bar Bev. Bev, and this is Bar Barbara. Right, Barbara. and they design these beautiful bags and other other items. And let me ask you how you came up with the idea of doing this. Actually, that Barbara did with a friend had bought a bag and wanted some improvements on it, and she worked with her and designed it, and then we ended up getting it patented. Oh. Our bags are patented. That is amazing. So the designs are mostly yours? Well, we improved on a design to get the patent of it, but they are a beach bag and towel, so they're all one piece. Oh, how beautiful. So we have them for adults and kids, and it just kind of started from there. And we were going to a different building, and they said, oh, it's so hot in here with the cubicles. Could you make us some neck coolers? And then in the corner, we have our neck coolers, where we're actually activating them now. And they've been selling very well all the time. How do you activate them? They have crystals inside of them, sewn in there, and you put them in water for about 15 minutes, and then they get up like this, and yeah, the crystals absorb the water. Mm -hmm. The crystals, ab the crystals absorb the water. Right, said. and then when they get warm next to you, you turn them, and it keeps going like that. Any water source will reactivate as long as the material stays moist. They are marvelous. They really are. I bet you've done well today. It's the hottest weekend of the year. Yeah. So do you use recycled material in any of this, or is it all? It's all new fabrics. All new fabrics. They're cottons, and, um, and we, we love, we, actually, we got started with the scrunchies, the hair scrunchies, and mm -hmm. the neck coolers from portions of the material that we had from our bags. So not much goes to waste. Oh, 
That's wonderful. And and you're from San Francisco? I'm from Lincoln. I Lincoln. used to be in Fremont, and I retired and moved up to Lincoln. Barbara's South San Francisco. You're South San Francisco. Yes, I am. How long, how long have you worked together? Since 1996. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're sisters, so we've yeah. known each other for a long time. Oh, <laughs> yes, and you always got along. You didn't fight when you were little or anything. Oh, I'm sure we did. <laughs> I remember fighting with our older brother. <laughs> oh, we've grown out of that now. We enjoy, you know, working together. We oh. don't do a lot of shows together, so it's really fun to catch up with each other since yeah. she lives more towards Sacramento area. Oh, that's sad. That's great. Thank you guys so much. What a wonderful booth you have. We'll Thank look you. forward look forward to see look forward to seeing you for the weekend. Yeah. We'll be here. Yeah. Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival for 2013. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and my co-host, Teresa Condon. And we're joined right now by Oscar Garcia, the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce for here in Mountain View. How's it going? Oh, going fantastic. Uh, certainly a little cooler than yesterday, but uh, another great, uh, very successful art and wine festival. And for people who like heat, they won't be disappointed anyway. Not at all, no. We are very fortunate here at Mountain View. Great. Well, tell us what's new at the festival this year. You've obviously put a lot of work into it, but things change every year. We do. Uh, you know, every year this festival really is a true partnership. Uh, we call it community celebration. A lot of organizations coming together, such as KMBT and many others. Uh, but the other thing too is uh, we also try to change things up a little bit uh, so that it's not just your ordinary art and wine festival. And this year, one of the uh, biggest uh, new things is uh, a salsa band. For the first time in the history of the art and wine festival, we have a salsa band that's going to be playing actually at 1.30 today. And salsa music is very popular. It doesn't matter what uh, ethnic group, age group, or whether you know how to dance or don't know how to dance. Uh, it is a very popular uh, music uh, genre. So we have salsa uh, band playing this afternoon. And where are where can people go to hear the salsa music? So we have uh, at the music stage, uh, right in the City Hall, Civic Plaza, that's where the uh, salsa band will be playing today. Okay, great. So Oscar, um, there's a lot of art and wine festivals in the Bay Area during the summer months. What makes the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival the best one? There are several things. Uh, one of the things that differentiates our festival uh, from other uh, art and wine festival is uh, um, the artists. We actually only allow artists that actually uh, make or they sell what they make. We don't allow any resellers, so we're able to keep the authenticity or the genuineness of a true art and wine festival, which is really the history of art and wine festival, is to get local artists to an opportunity to sell uh, what it is that they make. So again, after 42 years, we've been able to maintain that. Other uh, festivals, they uh, allow resellers, and it just, in my opinion, it just kind of diminishes that uniqueness. Yeah. So. I can only imagine the kind of effort and time that must go into planning an event like this. Could you give us an idea of the process that go, and the hard work that goes into putting together an event of this it size? It really does take a lot of effort. We actually start planning in January uh, for this festival and uh, we, we have a committee. Uh, we meet once a month and uh, then we also start reaching out to our volunteers. We use nearly 600 volunteers uh, to help run uh, this art and wine festival. And um, it, it really truly is, I mean, eight blocks of Castor Street, all of downtown Castor Street that uh, we close, uh, over 150,000 people uh, that attend this festival. Uh, it's, so it does take a lot of effort. Well, how do you market this and how does a vendor that's uh, thinking about coming next year reach out to you so they can participate? So we have, uh, just go, if vendors want to participate, they can go onto the Chamber's uh, homepage under uh, events and they can get information there. And in terms of marketing, uh, we market it uh, on the newspaper, um, TV, radio, uh, also social media as well. And then again, also the vendors themselves and other local businesses help us promote the uh, festival. So it sounds like word of mouth is really very important in helping get the word out and getting people to come back every year. Yeah, word of mouth for sure is the number one uh, way that we help uh, promote this. Social media is uh, something that's also taken off quite a bit. In fact, actually really interesting, in the last month, we've seen the number of likes to the Mount Art Wine Festival page uh, almost uh, about two and a half times increase. Uh, uh, from that so yeah it is social media is another medium congratulations on that and so the word of mouth and social media is that how you get people to come from as far away as Reading and beyond 
Yes, uh, we do. A lot of it, uh, you know, and the other thing too is, you gotta remember uh, people uh, through some of our programs like Leadership Mountain View, uh, people go through that program, they move out of the area, um, you know, or people just growing up here. I've, I've been fortunate, I've grown up here, Mountain View, still live here in Mountain View, but I have a lot of friends that I grew up with in school, moved out of the area, and that this is kind of turns out to be sort of like a, a get together, uh, a once a year to meet some friends and you come to the Art and Wine Festival. Well, that really brings home how important an event like this is to the community spirit in towns like Mountain View, which are in general very international. It's, it's a really welcoming place for people from anywhere. It is. We, Mountain View is a very diverse community. And so if you look around at the different artists, the, the types of food, of course, the music, uh, even the drinks. I mean, we got some margaritas and mimosas, too. <laughs> as well as wine, you know. So, and yeah. sangria. And sangria. Yeah. <laughs> so we cover all different uh, taste buds. Well, um, just uh, we've got a few seconds left. We're going to get you into trouble now. Any booth you're going to stop by and take something home from? Oh, uh, the kettle corn. That's my favorite. <laughs> Uh, I think there'll probably be a long line there. Yes. I don't think you're alone there. And I may race you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for stopping by and speaking with us. And let's go to the street and see what people are saying there. Hi, this is Diane Sparks. I'm at the Wine and Arts Festival here in Mountain View. And we, walking up to this booth, we could just smell these wonderful smells. And I'd like our artist to talk to us about what he does. What's your name? Hi, my name is Dennis Olarte, and we own Essence of O, which is a business that specializes in making handmade glycerin soap. We make natural soap. Uh, we use natural micas for color. All of our soap is made with vegetable oil, no animal fat, no detergent, uh, nothing that's bad for you. All the things that we put in our soap are things that we can pronounce. So what's nice about our soap is that it has glycerin. And what glycerin is, is a humectant. And what that means is that it draws moisture from the atmosphere onto your skin. And what a lot of people don't understand is that all soap has glycerin. But the store-bought soap, they remove the glycerin because it's really expensive and then they replace it with detergent. So the store-bought soap is made with detergent and animal fat and it dries you out and it pre-ages your skin. This is really healthy, it's really good and you can get it right now at the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. And so these beautiful colors and like I don't know how anybody could even use one of these bars of soap. They're so beautiful, but then it, it just probably activates the scent even more once you lather it up, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It not only activates it, but what it does is it's, it puts you in a certain mood. For instance, a spearmint will, will waken you up. A lavender will relax you. So it's not only that you're getting the glycerin and it's really good for your skin, it's setting the mood and it's setting the whole stage for your entire day or evening. So when you're ready to to do something great this is the kind of soap that you need yeah um so like this is such a bright color right here wow it's like gorgeous this is our love spell so those are this is the soap that we recommend for those very special moments in fact i've got a really nice story about our love spell a woman came to us and she was she was a single woman and she says to us she says now if i buy this love spell does it come with a guarantee and i said absolutely if you are not married in one year we'll give you back your money she came back a year later and introduced me to her fiance yeah that's an absolute, you're a matchmaker absolute <laughs> true story i got goosebumps that's our love spell Thank you so much for talking with me, and wow, you're such an inspiration. Love your personality, Thank and we you. love your work. Thank, Thank you for stopping, and uh, we wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're speaking with Chris Kennedy of Chris Kennedy's Handmade Quality World Class Leather, and Ed Livingston, who is with Chris, and the work is so beautiful and so versatile. How did you become interested in this? Uh, back in 1973, I was stuck in Apache Junction, Arizona, and there was a leather shop there, and the, uh, the owner needed some help, so he offered to teach me how to do the leather work, and that's where it started. It is just amazing, and what products do you have? I, we can see them all here, but tell us about them. Well, um, our main product um, is our belts. Uh, I 
pick out the leather, hand pick each hide, and I do all the, the designing and construction of all of our items. Our belts are almost, almost all of our belts are on snaps, so if you have your own buckle, you can put it on there. People really, really like that. And we have everything from dress belts to plain belts, and then a lot of specialty belts, and they're very high quality, and we use very high quality leather and hardware. She also makes some. Um she also makes uh, belt pouches that double as shoulder purses, uh, specialty belts, things for the wrist, and other accessories like checkbook covers, wallets, and keychains. Beautiful. And the, the belt buckles, do you make those also? No, I don't make the belt buckles. The belt buckles are from England. They are just amazing. And, and these are wrist strap things. These are uh, can be used as a wristband or can be used as a watch band. I have mine on a my watch on a watch band so either way beautiful it is so nice and and you said in 1972 you started when you were in Arizona 73 yeah 70. mm -hmm. 73 close enough great and is this your full-time uh, business yes mm -hmm. and you said you were from Richmond mm -hmm. and so do you do many shows in the area yeah um, pretty much all our shows are in uh, in the greater Bay Area it's great. And so you enjoy coming to Mountain View. Have you been here several Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we have we come here twice a year for the two Mountain View shows. Art a la carte and the Art and Wine That's Festival. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. This is beautiful. We'll have to come back and... He's like, here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Now. <laughs> Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival for 2013. I'm Chris Pareja, this is Teresa Condon, and now we're joined by Dave Grissom, the principal of Mountain View High School. Welcome, Dave. Well, thank you very much for having me. So, uh, have you gotten a chance to wander around the festival much, or did they drag you straight over here? Um, I got dragged a little bit straight over here, although uh, I have to admit, I, I cannot believe how big this Art and Wine Festival is. I'm just kind of a encompasses what Mountain View is all about. Well, you definitely can feel the community vibe here, but obviously the high schools here, the students that come out of it, contribute heavily to the high, to the community vibe. Tell us a little bit about your goals for the year and rolling things out. Yeah, um, you know, a year ago, uh, the Board of Education for Mountain View Los Altos uh, uh, took a, a pretty risky, or I won't say risky, but a big step in regards to grading practices, um, which was monumental, uh, something that I hadn't seen a school district do before, and uh, one, one of our goals this year is just to kind of create some um, consistency to those grading practices, um, allowing students to, to truly show who they are and what they have learned, um, and it has been uh, it's been some, some big work early on, but it's, it's already produced some really, really nice results for I think the end user in particular, that being the parents and students. Um, another goal that, that we've created this year really is, is in regards to Common Core. Um, Common Core is, a, is, is the next step in education uh, throughout the United States. And it is, it is going to, that the old state standards that, that we're used to and the old API and those kinds of things, those measuring sticks, um, are, are greatly going to change um, over the next 12 to 24 months. And uh, there's, a, there's a real need for us to, uh, to look at um, how we're delivering curriculum, um, the instruction practices that we use, and, uh, and we're just at the first steps of that. Um, 47 states have adopted um, the standards, and, uh, and we'll be full board into that uh, come 12 months from now. And uh, the, first, the first assessments for that will be about 18 months out. And, uh, and it'll be a huge change, a, a, an absolutely monumental change in the way we deliver curriculum uh, throughout this country. Uh, 47 states, I mean, there's only four that, four that includes Washington, D.C. that haven't jumped aboard yet. And I, I would assume that most of those would as well. And the third really is just kind of build community and build uh, the culture both on campus and within the city of Mountain View and the city of Los Altos for that matter. 
Um, you know, they are just absolutely wonderful communities to work with. Um, I, I, I've said this before in, in, in some PTSA meetings and other things, but I just never felt more welcomed at a place. Um, the people and the communities here are just, they're spectacular. They really, really are. Well, Dave, you sound extremely excited about your new role and very, very passionate about these new changes that are coming. Um, I understand you were previously the principal at Santa Clara High School. Could you give us some more information about your background there? Yeah, I was. Uh, I worked. I started teaching at Santa Clara High School 18, 19 years ago. Um, worked at Santa Clara High predominantly most of my career. Um, became a principal there six years ago. I served as an administrator prior to that for seven. So. I was at Santa Clara High as administrator for 13 years. Um, there are drastic changes, drastic differences between the two communities. I have never been in a school district before that does so much for kids, and it is—it uh, is just been, it's, it's unbelievable. And that that goes from the tutoring centers that we have on campus um, that are open. I was, I was going to say 24 hours, but that might be a stretch, but. You know, open 12, 14 hours a day for kids, um, and it's a campus that truly never sleeps. Um, from uh, the school day to those things that are happening after school, um, whether that's sports or music, a huge music program at Mountain View High School, and it's really, really exciting. Huge choir program at Mountain View High School. Uh, I'm really excited about the drama program as well. Um, we have a new, we have a new instructor this year, and he is. Uh, worked in New York, worked on Broadway for a while, and he is, um, you can already tell the differences that he's made for students as well. Uh, and in the community, I mean, the community is, uh, it really, really supports Mountain View. And I won't say they didn't in Santa Clara, but uh, it's a different, it's a very different community, and uh, in a very positive way. And that's definitely in Santa Clara, because I loved it there, but, um, but, they're just very, very passionate, especially about what the students are doing in the classroom. Oh, yeah. Well, great, Dave. Thank you so much. It sounds like there's a lot of exciting changes ahead at the high school, and um, I'm sure the students are lucky to have you there. So let's take a break and go to the street and see what people are saying. Hi, I'm Diane Sparks, and I'm going to interview a musician who uh, has a beautiful instrument, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself and talk about your interest instrument. Okay. I'm Bob Culbertson, uh, and the uh, instrument that I'm playing is called the Chapman Stick. So it'll be on our YouTube channel. And it's been around since 1974, uh, invented by Emmett Chapman out of Southern California. The sound is created by hammer-on. That means I hit the string into the fret, causes it to vibrate. So here's a chord. Now I can add the bass and also the melody here. So each hand is playing a separate part. And there's no strumming involved. Like, because it, you know, you think of the guitar, how you would strum, but this is, and this is all made out of wood, right? Yeah, it's all made out of wood. Of course, well, the metal frets and all, but the... And then there's 12... 12 strings. 12 strings. Okay, and then so did you, when did you start playing? I started playing in 1976. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so do you have any performers that perform with you or do you only do a solo act? Mostly solo, but I do have a drummer that I play with, Rick Allegria, and sometimes I even add other people in to the mix. Thank you for talking with me and we're just going to let the camera roll while you play. Thank you so yeah. much.
Yeah. Is it, is it? We're speaking with Sherry Cohen, who with Brian Guyberson have Indigo Lights, a very multicultural, multi-purpose ex exhibit. And tell us about your work. Well, both my husband and I uh, are very drawn to the ancient world, to the sense of wonder and magic, which is why he does these long wall pieces, we call them totems. They're very shamanistic. They represent ancient cultures, kind of like old, old cultures used to have identifiers that either said, welcome or stay away. And this is uh, the voice of that. This has the feel of that, the flavor of that. My work also has a lot of ancientness running through it. We do uh, what most people think of as steampunk. Um, it's the Victorian vision of what the future was supposed to look like. Like, for instance, Flash Gordon. Vision, so trips to the rocket, rocket ships to the moon and, and ray guns and airships and all those things that at the time when they first came up with Flash Gordon was only imagination. And so when you think about all of the mechanicalness of steampunk, it's supposed to work. It was supposed to make our lives better. It was supposed to help us explore the center of the earth. It was supposed to help us go to places that we couldn't go to. And that's the kind of thing that we try and tap into with our work. It's just beautiful. And where is your studio? In Orange County. Orange, Co yes. Orange County. Orange We're County, near Laguna Beach. Near south of Los Angeles. South of Los Angeles, yes. Wonderful. Do you come to this show every year? No, we don't. Yeah. This is the first time we've done it in years, but we do do a bunch of Bay Area shows. We did uh, La Palo Alto just two weeks ago. We do a series, we do about four to five shows up in the Bay Area a year. So, work is just beautiful. How long have you, have you had this business? 19 years. This is your full-time occupation? And that, plus I teach metalsmithing. Oh. Yes. That's wonderful. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful work. Is there anything you would like to point out? For anything the particularly that you like? Just trying to death with the way that one came out. It's brand, brand new, and it is amethyst. I'm sorry, amethyst and crystal, sterling silver. The process is called lost wax cast. This is amethyst and crystals. Uh, and uh, many people think you have to be really tall to wear things like this. And I tell them that the size you are on the outside doesn't matter. The size you are on the inside is all that matters. And my jewelry is the celebration of spirit. It wants people to notice you. It wants to stop people in their tracks. I'm one of those people that I want, if you're wearing one of my jewelry and you walk into a room, everybody stops and looks at you. Beautiful. I Just beautiful. I like what you're wearing Thank now. You. Yes, I call that my airship panel, and this little piece here moves around. This little piece here just moves all the way around. These are, we make these, we, we take antique mantel clocks, and we take them apart. And we use all the pieces, not just the gears. Again, because it's supposed to be functional, so, and because these are brass, I can solder them, so I mix them with all kinds of different parts and put them together to create a new art. But again, it looks like, this almost looks like a key, as if you were to put it into something and it would suddenly activate a machine. And so all of them should have a flavor of a journey, a story, something that makes them wonderful. Just amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the time and explaining your booth. This is truly... Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival for 2013. Again, I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and my co-host, Teresa Condon. We're joined right now by someone very important to us here at KMVT, and that would be Shelly Wolf. She makes sure things continue to stay running smoothly, and I can tell you that I'm a big fan. Whenever I have a question or a resource that I need, Shelly is the keeper of all information, and surprisingly, I think this is an under understood resource for Absolutely. the community. Absolutely. And when you look at cost-effective uh, studios with fired up volunteers who want to make good things happen for people and really I mean I'll give you an honesty moment some of the guests that we've had come onto my show 
think everything's okay till they get there and see a full crew of people and all the equipment <laughs> and the sound studio and they say, wait a minute, this is real stuff. Yep. How do you keep it all running and what's happening that's new at KMVT? Sure, well we keep it running by um, volunteers. I mean volunteers like yourself that get involved every day and want to produce programs and uh, work on cameras and that sort of thing. So for us it's really exciting because we do a lot of training. So that's one of the areas where we're growing our programming. We're doing lots of training and new production areas. Uh, we were able to buy some new equipment last year, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But right now, for us, it's exciting because we're expanding programs, really reaching out to different markets, trying to make sure people do know that we exist. Because you're absolutely right. It's a very much underlying, under-resourced area that people do not know about. And uh, for me, I've spent a long time um, working on trying to really expose what KMBT is all about. And it's a resource for anyone that wants to get involved, learn how to do video production, learn what a studio is all about, wants to get in front of the camera, and it's all easy. I mean, people pay millions of dollars to go to school and buy equipment and do all this, and you can turn around and right in your own backyard have really cost-effective training, and it's all hands-on right in our studio. Well, and also, you don't just do this for people. You do it for the youth. You do it for people who are doing it for fun, yeah. people who want to test out a new career path potentially. Absolutely. Talk to us about the differences between those levels of... Sure, sure. So we have, uh, this past year, we actually started an after-school program working at Graham Middle School, and by doing that, we uh, work with middle school students, and they learn the cameras, learn how to switch, learn how to do commentary, are covering their arts programs in schools, and creating their own public service announcements. So things that are really important to them. So we started with that process, and the kids then come in, they can take our camps. We have uh, great summer youth programs that we offer, and then we have great classes for adults as well. So adults can come in, again, it's all hands-on training, um, wanting to learn a new career, which is actually how I started out in, in this business. And you did, you got a career out of it. I got a career out of it, <laughs> career out of it believe it or not. And I started my own production company out of it years ago. So for me, it was a really, again, hands-on experience is what we offer. And so we really try to focus on anybody who's interested in starting a new career. We're working with some veterans, trying to bring them in to offer them new outlets. Uh, we work with a lot of seniors. Seniors really love the program as well because for them, it keeps their minds going. They get to work with like-minded folks. And that's the great part. We have a great time. I mean, we've got folks from 10 years old all the way up to 92. And everybody works together. And we have a lot of fun. We create quality program. Um, we win awards every year for what we're doing. So, you know, we're very excited. We're very excited. This year we're actually the host for the Alliance for Community Media um, Conference, which is actually a national conference, but they also have a regional conference. And we will be bringing community access centers from seven western states to the area. And with that, um, we'll be have innovators and technology folks and those that want to learn more about nonprofits and how to use Google resources um, are all going to be there. So anybody can sign up for this and come to the event and learn more just about community media and how it supports their community. So, Shelly, how is the Going Digital Capital campaign going? Well, that's a good one. <laughs> so it's actually going really well. Uh, we launched our Go Digital Capital campaign last year to raise $500,000 to upgrade our studios from analog to digital. Uh, we raised $125,000, so we were very successful with that thanks to Los Altos and to uh, the city of Cupertino, as well as our volunteers for really getting behind and understanding the support that was needed for this. We still got $375,000 to go. Uh, that will enable us to actually buy some new cameras, update our lighting equipment, so it's really going to um, offer a new green, greener footprint in the area. Um, but also allows us to go out into the marketplace. And so like if you're a business or you're a school and you want us to come train, we can train right into on your location as well. So uh, we're out there raising money. It's continuing and uh, it's, a, it's a long battle, but we're actually you know reaching out to the community, asking them to give us support for this. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And let's go check out a demo of this. KMVT 15 Silicon Valley Media is a nonprofit community media and television station that has been serving the community since 1982. Each year, KMVT trains hundreds of adults and youth in video production, claymation, field production, and digital literacy. In 2012, we launched a $500,000 Go Digital Capital campaign to begin upgrading our analog equipment to digital. This would allow us to stay current with the technologies that folks utilize in their everyday lives. We want to thank the City of Los Altos, Cupertino, and our volunteers for supporting our digital campaign. In doing so, last year we raised over $125,000, which allowed us to begin crucial upgrades to our studio. Our first upgrades began with a brand new control room and a digital switcher. 
The digital switcher allows us to provide green screen opportunities, live interactive productions utilizing Google Hangouts and Skype, and to stream live to YouTube and Ustream. The monies raised also allowed us to put the same switcher into our production truck that allows us to provide full coverage of local sports with a three camera replay system. Our other large investment was a full digital playback system. The system allows producers to submit digital files from home. We can run the channel for a full 24 hours. We also are streaming on peg.tv through Roku. This offers our producers a much wider distribution platform to a much larger audience. All of this has been made possible in the last year with your donations. As our campaign continues, we need to upgrade the rest of our equipment to high definition. The next purchases will be cameras, lights, and audio gear. Please support KMBT 15 in raising its next round of funding to complete its Go Digital Capital campaign. Thank you again to our supporters for understanding the importance of these upgrades. By investing in KMBT 15, you are enabling us to provide low-cost training, new technologies, and a community voice. Again, we thank you for your support. Donate today. I'm at the Fine Arts Festival here in Mountain View, and I'm standing here with a uh, artist who makes these very unique hummingbird feeders, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Chandra Calloway with Fragilities Glass. Okay. And tell me how you think of these ideas to make these very unique ones. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmares, dreams, just trying to produce something that's fun and arty for people, not just your ordinary plastic one out there. So we create everything here ourselves. We make the um, all of the feeder tubes, and then we've just recently started to make our little uh, metal fe feeder tubes. So it's been a lot of fun. And where is your base? We're out of Sacramento. Yeah, not too far. Uh -huh. And so have you been to this wine, uh, wine and Arts Festival before in the past? It's about 15 years of it, so. Yeah. So this, did you make this as well? Yes, this is what I started with. I've been doing stained glass for about 25 years now, and then I've just, <laughs> you know, as we get older, we uh, change into different things, and so the hummingbird feeders are a new thing for us now, so we really enjoy them. And so what about the colored glass? Do you color the glass as well? No, no, no. We try to try to purchase bottles or find bottles. We do a lot of Goodwill, Salvation Army, those kind of things, garage sales, and then. So it's an ecology thing. You're actually recycling. Yes, everything's recycled, vintage. You bet. Yeah. Okay. So, um, anything else you want to tell us about your art? Uh, oh, well, look at this one. 
<laughs> with the goblet and... Well, see, that's a good endorsement. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is fabulous. I know. You, you start to see all of, like, Grandma's dishes and things wow. like that, her teapots. So it's, it's a usually a good feeling. One of the best things about in here is, is the story behind because people will come in and say, look at that face or it's a goblet. Grandma had that at her table. So it's really a, a nice, it gives us a nice feeling. Yeah, they can relate to it maybe. Exactly. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Wow. We're speaking with Carol Glasshoff of Napa Valley, East Bay, of Glasshoff Custom Glass Designs, and what wonderful work you have. What, what different products do you have? Um, I sell pendants and uh, little dishes, little um, heart plates for jewelry or so, and wall hangings, and then large pieces of art. So beautiful. What made you become interested in this? Um, well, I a actually went to art school. So I have a bachelor's degree in glass, so... With a name like Glass Off, that, that would be... <laughs> <laughs> that's my karma. <laughs> that's, that's perfect. It is so beautiful. How long have you, have you had this business? Um, several years now, yeah. It, it is just beautiful. Do you come to many of the shows? Yes, I do all the shows here in the Bay Area. And then in the winter, I go to Arizona and I do the art shows in Arizona. Wonderful. So you enjoy Mountain View. Uh -huh. Do you come to both of the shows in Mountain View? Yes, yes I do. It is just beautiful. What is your favorite type of art or do you just enjoy it all? Um, well, uh, my favorite method of working with glasses is like cast glass. Um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed doing this process which is called Pat de Verre. And um, because it's, it takes, it's such a technical um, way of working with glass so that I like the challenge. Of, of what it takes so so I, I probably of all the work I like to do I, I, I like to do the wall pieces the, the most the wall, the wall pieces so beautiful and, and the large plates or, or wall designs they are so beautiful and your, your son says Napa is that kind of where your studio is? Um, no it's in the East Bay in the East Bay but Napa is a good a good sign name. <laughs> a good pinpoint. Yes, it's so beautiful. And um, well, thank you so thank you so much. It was so such a beautiful beautiful booth and ex exhibit. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, thanks, guys. I'm here with Maki, who's a setter on the St. Francis Lady Lancers volleyball team. Welcome, Maki. So I, I was a Lancer myself at one point, so I do know how special the high school yes. is in general, but what makes being a part of the Lancers volleyball team so special? Well, the community itself is awesome. The support that you get being on the volleyball team is amazing. They kind of look to us as support and kind of we run the athletic community where they know that we have such a big standing and that, that they trust us. Okay, well that's great. And um, I understand that you recently had a tournament, a tournament yes. opening that you played in. How did that go? Uh, we played some really great teams. It's definitely a learning experience. And we have a very big variety of all positions and years. And we're just kind of coming together as a unit and playing all together and we have some great team chemistry. Great, well how did, you, how did the team do in the tournament opening? We went we won three games and we lost two. Um, definitely a learning experience, like I said. And we're going to come back this week. We have three games and we're going to come back swimming in. Okay, great. Well, what are you mentioned that you it was a great learning experience. Yeah. What are some of the lessons you learned and things you're going to work on to improve next time? Well, Coach has been emphasizing working together as a unit instead of an individual where we're coming together as a team and more focusing on another person, setting them up for success. Mm -hmm and that's really what we've been focusing on and once we come together as a unit and not really care about ourselves is when we're going to be successful. Well these, those sound like really great lessons you've been learning. Yeah. So, Well let's take a minute and throw it back to Chris at the booth. Thank you for being with us Matthew. Thank you. The, um... 
Thanks, Teresa. And back here at the booth, I'm now joined by Jamie Garrett of the Mountain View Fire Department. So, Jamie, tell us a little bit about some of the things that are going on over there and uh, how you guys are getting the word out about some of your programs. Uh, thanks so much for having me here today. One of the newer ways that we're working to get our fire prevention uh, messages out to the community is through social media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter. Um, our uh, handle is MTNVIEWFIRE. Um, and that's on Facebook, Twitter, and any of the other social media um, outlets that we're using. And so how are you using social media to reach out to the community? I'm a marketing guy when I'm not doing this as we were starting to talk about. It's always interesting to me how public agencies are getting the word out. Well, we are really starting to use it um, as a way to do community outreach. So our prevention messages, um, as well as during times of a disaster. We want to make sure that we have the um, community's support and, and they know where to go to get the message before something happens so that we can be the trusted um, voice to provide that information. And so are you, so you're doing the things that are safety related, but you're also doing some fun related things like probably promoting pancake breakfast and that kind of thing. Of course, there's always a few uh, fun things going on and our upcoming pancake br uh, breakfast is one of them. It is gonna be on October 5th. Uh, it's held out at fire station number four, which is out on Wisman Road. And um, it's a great morning. There's tons of different activities. You can come out and spray the fire hose. There's a rappelling demonstration. Um, you can climb through the fire engine. Besides having a great breakfast on top of it, um, it's also a fundraiser for the Byrne Foundation. So you fill people up with pancakes and then you send them through the fire trucks and everything else. Does, do you have anybody get wedged when that occurs? Have they eaten too many not pancakes? Yeah, but we do have the tools to get somebody out. So we're all good with that. <laughs> but you're not looking to do that demo necessarily no. behind the fire truck. No, Jaws of not. life, no? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> we have them there available just in case. And so uh, there's an initiative coming up on fire safety or fire prevention month. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the official title of it? Sure. So um, there's one week in October that is designated as fire prevention week. Um, and this year's theme is to prevent kitchen fires. So um, it's kind of the pancake breakfast is our kickoff to that week. And we do a variety of different safety messages throughout the event. Um, but we also send people home with a lot of different information uh, about how they can be fire safe in their own homes. Okay. And so what what do you see that's a common occurrence that the fire truck has to leave the firehouse and if you had your way they wouldn't have to? Um, we're always happy to go out on calls. Um, no matter big or small, if you feel like you need help from us, please feel free to call us. Um, we go on everything from medical calls to fires to somebody stuck in an elevator and we're happy to do so. So there's nothing really that we would not be happy about going well, out on. I'm looking at more from a preventative perspective. There, there are the things that's like, yes, we'll go for any reason, but really, you know, if you would have just unplugged the toaster or whatever it happens to be, are there any of those kinds of things that pop up from time to time? Nothing that I can think of off the top of my head, actually. There, we're always, um, when we get there, we always feel like we're able to make a difference um, to the community members. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you for what you do to keep the community safe and educated. And at this point, we're going to jump back to another part of the festival and see what's happening out in the streets. Hola, soy Irene Mendoza. Estoy aquí con Alan Sao del Consulado de México en San Jose, California. Y dígame, uh, ¿cómo uh, otra vez? No, no la agarré. Alan Sao del Consulado Mexicano en San Jose, California. Okay. Y Alan, ¿qué estás haciendo? ¿Qué estás tratando de hacer hoy en día aquí en Mountain View? Pues eh, más que nada hemos estado en conjunto con uh, el Departamento de Salud de, del Condado de Santa Clara y a uh, uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital uh -huh. y estamos uh, tratando de correr la voz en cuestiones de salud. Nosotros tenemos un programa del Consulado de México que se llama Ventanilla de Salud y estamos promocionando uh, todos los servicios de salud que se ofrecen en el condado, además enfatizando la, la prevención de, H, eh, de VIH y prevención de enfermedades de transmisión sexual también. Y entonces aquí hay algún representante de, 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 de la salud para que nos pueda ayudar con eso? Eh, de hecho, yo estoy encargado de los servicios okay. de salud en, la, en, en, en el Consulado de México, y principalmente de nuestro programa que se llama Ventanilla de Salud, que está encar en, eh, encargado de referir en cuestiones de salud a, lo, a, a tanto a mexicanos como a personas que lo soliciten en, en, en el consulado. Además de que estamos ofreciendo pruebas de salud gratis en el consulado, que son uh, pruebas de presión y de uh, glucosa. ¿Y en, en, en qué tiene un sitio web para que puedan ir los, la gente a, a buscar esta información? ¿Dónde puede, además del consulado, ¿dónde más pueden hacer los um, exámenes para esos tipos de conventorías de salud? Eh, 
Ventanilla de Salud tiene eh, información, pueden ir a visitarlo, nosotros estamos localizados en el 2125 Sanker Road de San José, California. Ok, y vamos a ver, tratando de buscar qué más preguntar, pero no tengo nada más. So, gracias por su tiempo y, y, y gracias. De nada, okay. gracias para servirles. Gracias. Hi, so I'm going to interview band members from House Rockers. So I was wondering how the, you got the name uh, House Rockers, and did you were you a garage band to begin with? Uh, no, well, I'll answer the first part. So there are actually lots of House Rockers across the country. It's kind of like a catch-all name for you know big bands. A lot of blues bands are called House Rockers, but when we did it here in the Bay Area, there wasn't a House Rockers here in the Bay. Still isn't a House Rockers here in the Bay Area, and it just uh, you know it kind of evokes the spirit of kind of a house party, which is what we're all about. Okay, tell me your name, please. I'm Paul Kent. And your name? And I'm Nick Chargan. Okay. And what instruments do you play? I play guitar and sing. Okay. Lead lead vocal. Yep. And I play keyboards and sing. Lead vocal. Okay. What kind of music do you play? Everything. <laughs> you name it, we play it. Well, maybe not house music so much. As Paul likes to say on stage, we do pretty good with the 60s yep. and the 70s. Yep. The 80s, it starts to thin out a little more. Once you get to the 90s and the 2000s, yeah. then there's only a couple here and there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you do Beatles, Beach Boys. Uh, we do Beatles, we do a lot of Springsteen, we do a lot of Stevie Wonder, some Earth, Wind & Fire. Nice. We do a Michael Jackson song or two. You know, uh -huh. Tower of Power. A lot of Tower of Power. We've got, we got a five-piece horn section. So. Oh, I was just going to ask you, you have your brass in your band. Yeah. Ooh, cool. Yeah, it's a ten-piece band. Okay, we're going to get to listen to them play here in a few minutes. Um, that would be great. Can't wait to hear you play. So, um, how many members in the band? Ten piece. Ten people. Eleven if you include our sound man, which, uh -huh. which we really need he to. Works he works hard, right? He can't do what we do if he's <laughs> not with us. He works harder than us. Uh -huh, That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and tell me, um, what else do you do? Like, do you do tours? We kind of tour the Bay Area, of, you know, from about April until October. We play about 50 gigs through the course of the summer and all over the Bay Area. Summer's your time, right? Uh huh. You get the the audience rocking in the summer, right? Yeah, nice. Do you do weddings or other yeah, kind I mean, of events? Yeah, if it's a wedding, if it's a place that's big enough to hold a ten-piece band, and yeah. there's not too many grandmas who don't like loud music and uh -huh. that type of thing. Yeah, so. you need a pretty big stage. That's right. Yeah. yeah so that you know what? There are a lot of grandmas that love us. So, you know, my mom and my aunt, you know, they're up there dancing, you know. You get people out there on the <laughs> dance floor. Yeah, that's the good bands. Yeah, people really like when they can really groove. And then you got to play the slow songs, right? We do. You know, we play we play Tower Power slow song. We play Still a Young Man. Nick sings the hell out of it. It's like one of our showstoppers. We play My Girl because everybody loves My yeah. Girl. You know, uh, Nick goes back to the 60s and he does... Um, well, I'm doing uh, Let's Get It On, yeah, Marvin Gaye, Marvin Gaye. You know? So, yeah, we... Can, to yeah, hear you guys. A whole bunch of great stuff. Uh -huh. We like to say it's the greatest music ever recorded. That's what people come to see us yeah, for. Yeah, you do the hot songs yeah, that people pretty much know the lyrics to. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the thing about uh, our band is I, I like to think that there's something for everybody, you know. Yeah. It doesn't matter, you know, what you listen to. You're going to at least love some of what we do. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you do a wide mix of uh, entertainers and then so you try to emulate how they do it, or do you kind of uh, do your own spin on it? Well, you know, we're not the Jackson Five. You know, I, I think we get the influence from the original, but then it kind of comes out sounding like yeah. us to our arrangements, yeah. you know, to our styles and yeah. stuff like that. So, but the core, the soul, the heart of it comes from the original. I love it. Thank you guys for talking with me. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the 2013 Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. Again, I'm Chris Pareja, she's Teresa Condon, and we're joined by John Finks, who normally is the host of the show, John Wants Answers. Today, he's the one that's going to be uh, demanded of answers, and the first one to nail him with a question is going to be Teresa. What do you have to, to ask, John? So, John, I'm sorry to say I've never seen your show. Ever? Never ever. But you can go ahead and tell me right now, what is so great about your show? Oh, it's a great show. It's live, so we have audience interaction. Like if you're at home watching TV, you can tweet us during the show. It won't answer your questions. You can email us. If you can't get on your TV, you can watch us over the internet live. And we talk about things like civics, you know, like Supreme Court or, you know, government, that kind of thing. 
we talk about current events, like we'll talk about Syria, we'll talk about North Korea, and we'll talk about, you know, social issues. Like we did a show on being gay, we did a show on being transgender. So. Well, sounds like you're all over the map there, as far as subject matter. Anything that interests me will be on the show. <laughs> and so, great, if it interests you, that's one thing, but as anybody outside of you picked up on it, have you won any awards as an example? I've won two awards for one episode. So we did an episode last year on being gay. We had a guy on who's gay, and he told us all about growing up and living with being gay. And uh, it was really a great episode. And we won uh, two WAVE Awards for that episode. And so what is a WAVE Award? That's the Western Access Video Excellence Award. Excellence! It's um, all the West Coast states get together and pick out the best uh, public access shows around. Well, congratulations. Well, that sounds you. like a very impressive award. I was very happy. Was very Do excited. you have any plans in the future to win more awards? Oh, I'm always planning to win awards. So uh, the WAVE Awards are coming up again uh, in a few weeks or months. And we've submitted eight different shows in 16 categories. 16 categories. I tried to narrow it down to what shows <laughs> were award worthy. And it was very difficult because they're all so good. You know, we're getting into our, our prime, our stride. Well, now, since you're so much about audience participation, do you ever ask the audience which episodes you should be submitting? No. <laughs> that would have been a good thing to ask them. Well, what kind of categories do they, are you allowed to submit for? Oh, they've got a, like 30 different categories. And uh, anything that's not, you know, professional or by seniors is something I can enter in. Um, they had a religious category, and we entered two shows in the religious category. Uh, one about we did about the Pope, and one about Judaism. So that'll be uh, exciting to see if we win anything there. We have a lot of entertainment type categories, so just shows that were good for fun. Well, so and is what's the deadline, and when should we expect to see your name in the winning lights again? Oh, geez, uh, the the deadline to enter is behind us. Um, I don't know. Maybe my friend Jim can tell us when uh, the awards are announced. Does he know? He is saying in the next eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, we're looking forward to see to seeing if you uh, pull out another win. Yeah. Or more. And you can watch us uh, every week at 9.30 on KMVT. And the second week of the month, we're live. And the other weeks, reruns. <laughs> Well, thank you, John, for those great answers. <laughs> thank you for having me. And now, let's head back to the street to see what people are saying about the festival. Hi, I'm Diane Sparks. We're here at the Wine and Arts Festival in Mountain View, and I'm here with an artist who does two different kinds of beautiful art. Um, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, my name is O'Day Presley. Nice to meet you. First, let's talk about your paintings and that you do right here. Well, these are oils on canvas, and this is my salute to American heroes. Uh, I've got all of the uh, major wars and stuff of the over the years and stuff represented. All of them have a flag in them someplace and stuff, like in the water here. Okay. Okay, a little tiny one on the front of the chopper here oh. in the sky. Um, so it's just my salute to American heroes. Yeah, very, very, very beautiful. I paint them so people won't forget. Yeah, 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 that's very nice. Okay, let's move on to what you do over here with the metal. Okay. We, this is a product that is invented by my best friend. It's a uh, belt buckle knife, and it works like this. It lives on your belt buckle, wow. makes so a person never has to dig into a pocket again for a knife. If you're sitting in a boat, sitting on a horse, this knife is always handy. Yeah. Now it's held in with a magnet. It's designed so it won't come out easy. You have to tilt it forward and lift it out. This is the magnet that holds it in. Now this is a rare earth man-made magnet. It's one of the strongest in the world. Everything about us is quality. The blade is 440C stainless steel, keeps an edge forever, made in the USA. Inline lock so it won't close on your fingers while you're using it. My son and I make the holster and we made this in such a fashion it'll last for generations. Then in here, we have one of the world's smallest sharpeners. Now, the tip of this is tungsten carbide. This is one of the hardest materials known to man. It has a flat side and a round side. We use the leading edge of the flat side. Start at the bottom of a dull knife and work up. If there's nicks in the knife, you'll feel it in your hand. As soon as it runs smooth, turn it over, rake off the burrs, and you got a sharp knife in a matter of seconds. And that lives right here in the holster, so you always have it. There's no excuse now for a dull knife. 
Then on the back of it, we've added a fire starter, and it's called Ferrocerium, which is the newest generation of fire starter. And we use our sharpener as the striker, and we can make fire, and it, come on, anytime yeah, we want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so what about the carvings here? How do you do that? Now these are from our original designs and then we've had a stamp made and stuff and we stamp them into plates and then okay. adhere them to them and stuff. Beautiful. So you incorporate the stars and stripes, stripes and, in and, there. And, right. Well, we're a very patriotic com company and this is a you know, American-made product. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. I see flames and... Trees, yeah. all kinds of beautiful. Yeah, we have all kinds of designs and stuff. A lot of wildlife. We have a bear and a jumping trout and a howling wolf Aww. and um, things that are popular and stuff in today's society. Thank you so much for talking with me. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're speaking with Blake Richards, an art photographer at the Art and Wine Festival in Mountain View. And you have such a variety of photographs. What is your specialty? Basically, we do fine art photography and then actually family portraits, and we do sports photography. And our website is blakefineart.com for the fine art and winphotos.com if you want to get a family portrait. Wonderful. How did you get started in this? I've been doing this since 1973. I just took a photo class in high school and been doing it ever since. Wow, it is just wonderful. And, and do you have any preference or do you just love it all? I just love it all, and I was uh, fortunate enough when I was younger to study for a week or two with Ansel Adams oh my God. at his workshop, and it, it was very inspiring. That, that's amazing. Are you in uh, the Bay Area? I'm in Fremont, California, is oh. where our studio is. That's wonderful. And do you come to the show every year? Oh, I've been coming to the show for years, like 10, 12 years at least. That is just great. Could you show us what is your well, they're all your favorites, that's what you said. And there's so much sports photography. Is that just something that you happen to like to show? Oh, yeah. I like, well, I like MotoGP. There's like Valentino Rossi there. That's my favorite, like racing and Formula One racing. But, you know, everyone likes the Giants, Me Too, oh. and the A's. We have some A's pictures. and It's just great. And uh, so is this your full-time occupation? It's my full-time job. And what we do is we... Everything's done with the camera and then hours in Photoshop to make them look like the painterly look that they have. Well, just beautiful work. And obviously, you enjoy coming here. Do you go to any other shows in the area? Oh, yeah. We do the Fremont Art and Wine Festival, the Sunnyvale Art and Wine Festival, and a, a bunch of them, actually. Well, this, is, this is just great. Um, and is, are you, do you do this by yourself? Do you have family members that work with you? Oh, yeah, I have, a, I, I, I have a, a girl helping me here today and helping me set up and take it down and oh, wow. help me with the customers, definitely. That is just great. And uh, today, which is your favorite? Today, which is my... Of your favorite? I'm going to tell you what the, mo the, the one that sells the most. I okay. like it, too. It's right here, the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, that it, is... It, it's shot at Baker Beach. Baker Beach. That's our higher, highest selling picture. Have you shot any of the Bay Bridge? Oh, yeah. yeah. We, in fact, on our website, we have the Bay Bridge. I, w I was there one hour when it opened up and drove over it and did a picture of it and did the artwork of it. And the next day, I walked across it and photographed it already and oh. did the artwork of that. It's on our website, BlakeFineArt.com. BlakeFineArt.com. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you so much, no, Blake. Thank you. And we'll see you as the week progresses. Welcome back to our live. Co oh, are we? Oh, okay. When Welcome back to KMVT's live coverage of the 2013 uh, Art and Wine Festival. I'm Chris Pareja, one of your hosts, and I'm joined at this point by Chris Chung, who is here from the Mountain View Police Department. And specifically, Chris, we're going to be talking a little bit about social media outreach and what the department is doing to help keep citizens informed, right? That's correct. So tell us a little bit about how social media fits in with the overall police department program. Uh, well, we obviously the, the, the forefront would be any sort of emergency alert. So we would encourage our citizens here in Mountain View to, to follow us on a number of social media channels that we're on. If there's ever an emergency or something, we're going to use social media to communicate with the public. But on side of that, we also uh, tell the public a lot about the department inside, about our members, about our special units, about our canines. Canines are always a favorite. Right. 
And so how do you spread the word about those kinds of initiatives? Is it uh, you're using Facebook and, and uh, what other tools are you using? That's correct. We're on most of the major social media network channels, so like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Nextdoor, uh, Nixel. We uh, are involved in very much and, and pretty much anything that's popular out there right now, and we know that most of our citizens are, are using. Uh, we, we know it's an effective way to reach them. And just out of curiosity, for Mountain View residents, what seems to be the social media of choice, or does it really vary? Uh, it varies by age, by gender, but in general, Facebook and Twitter seem to be the most effective, and we really enjoy interacting with our community over those social media platforms. So it's not just a one-way push for you. You are actually having a dialogue with these folks. That's correct. Uh, anytime anyone asks us a question on social media, uh, we may not be able to respond right away. We try to, but in general, uh, we always regard it as two-way communication. Right. But as we talked about before the show, you're not texting from the car or anything dangerous, correct, right? No. At least not when it's moving. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Good. So uh, give us a little bit of background on what the different handles are and how people can find you, or is it a, confi uh, is it a consistent handle across the media? Okay, so for Twitter, it would be uh, Mountain View PD, or at Mountain View PD, and then uh, a great source of information to find out where all of our social media channels are is our blog site, and that's Mountain View PD blog.com so mountain view spelled out the letter p the letter d blog.com okay great and so what's been one of the most successful outreach programs you've done so far through social media uh, so in the last couple months we had an ongoing burglary series and we we started a campaign called see something say something we encouraged our community if they see something suspicious to let us know uh, we told our officers to expect these calls, and lo and behold, the, the community was great. They started calling in suspicious vehicles. Within a day or two, we caught a few different burglars in our neighborhoods. It was great. It was a great win. So that's really a way of showing the community participating. And do you get a different kind of response over the social media than you would, for example, from the normal 911 call or something like that? Absolutely. I think because social media is ingrained in everyone's, uh, you know, it's in everyone's pocket, their smartphone. They're used to using it, and they're used to reaching out to us, so we're real comfortable talking back to them on that. Well, Chris, we appreciate you sharing a little bit about what you're doing to be involved in the community, and at this point, we need to hear from the community and get back out into the streets and see what's happening at the festival. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diane Sparks. We're here at the 2013 Wine and Arts Festival here in Mountain View, and I'm standing here with a jewelry artist, and I'd love for you to meet him and him uh, listen to what he does. What's your name? Stuart Hartman. Please uh, tell us how, what inspires you to make so many different kinds of jewelry. Well, actually, um, <clears throat> probably the biggest motivating factor is to offer people a big variety. If you, if you narrow your product line too much, they, they lose interest rather quickly. So I see you have semi-precious stones, you have glass, you have uh, shells. Did I miss anything? <laughs> right. No, um, it's it's actually a little more refined than that. Uh, the glass pieces are very finely crafted Muranos that are handmade in Italy, and, and they've been doing that for centuries. Uh, we import them and make them into various pieces of, of jewelry. So you do the settings, like you'll buy, yes. you'll get the stone and then you'll set it? I'll set it in. Uh, sterling silver right now is probably the most popular medium because of the cost. Mm -hmm. uh, gold or gold filled, um, pure gold, 24 karat is out of the question. 14 is pretty much out of the question. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we offer sterling because it is a very fine metal for jewelry and it's uh, relatively easy to cast. So these are pins right here? Yes, those are pins. Uh, those are all Swarovski crystals. Oh. Our premium uh, signature line is our Lariat necklace which um, is on the trees there in front. I've been making those now for over 20 years and um, I feature them in um, gold or silver and they range from shells to pearls, semi-precious gemstones to the very finely crafted handmade Muranos 
They're absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for talking with me. Where, where do you do your work? Where's your studio? My studio is actually in my home. We converted one whole room. What city? Uh, Camarillo, California. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. We're speaking with Lisa and Randy McCormick of Lisa McCormick Jewelry. And tell us about your, your art and how you, how you decided to, to become an artist. Um, well, I use Swarovski crystal, which is the, the best crystal that you, you can come by. Um, I hand make everything. I also guarantee my work, uh, which is very rare, I know, for a lot of artists. So uh, I just enjoy making I love all the colors. And I have really good customers who um, come back every year. Your work is so beautiful, and I noticed you just had a customer who came to have jewelry repaired or altered. She, uh, no, she actually had a custom. She wanted something that wasn't on there, so I get that every now and then where someone doesn't want, they want it a little bit different. They don't want it to look like everyone else's, so, and, you know, I'm happy to do that for them. It's so beautiful, and, and where are you from? Dixon. 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 Uh, Port Sacramento, near UC Davis. Do you come to this show every year? Every year. This is my 10th year here. Wonderful. Yeah. Do you go to other shows in the area? We do. Uh, we'll be in Santa Clara next weekend. Uh, in two weeks, we'll be in Los Altos and then uh, Campbell for the Oktoberfest. That'll be our last show of the year. So we like this area. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, your work is so beautiful and Thank it's you. obviously very popular. How did you start doing this? I just became a hobby that got out of hand and my husband said, okay, you need to start selling that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's what got it started. That's, that's wonderful. So Randy, you're a big part of this also. Definitely. Oh, definitely. I am the helper on the weekends. Yeah. Um, you know, I work a full-time job, but on the weekends, I'm all hers, and I do what she uh, she tells me. That's great help. Uh, her, her famous line is not a problem, and then she throws it to me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so she does a lot of custom work on demand, and so uh, certainly we have all the jewelry that she makes uh, throughout the week here, but uh, a lot of custom things. So we bring all the uh, jewelry pieces with us so we can make custom things for people, custom size and custom design, all by Lisa. <laughs> oh, that is so beautiful. And did you study this? You said you, it became a hobby that went It just became a hobby. I took went classes out of here and there and, and uh, you know, purchased books and just kind of played with it and just thought, uh, you know, yeah, well, just kept going. <laughs> your work is so beautiful. And from all the people here, it's obvious that everyone is very <laughs> interested in your work. They do. Then they come back. I get a lot of repeat customers and kind of follow me from show to show. So I really appreciate all my customers. That is so wonderful. Thank you so much, Randy and Lisa. And enjoy the weekend. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Come back to you again. Okay. Bye. Welcome back. Again, this is Chris Pareja, and we're covering the Art and Wine Festival here in Mountain View Live. At this point, I'm joined by Maria Maruquin, and she's from the Day Worker Center here in Mountain View. Maria, tell us a little bit about what people can expect at the Day Center, or at the Day Worker Center on a daily basis. Well, people can expect wonderful workers ready to serve. So the workers can expect wonderful employers getting there to employ them. And the center is offers like a great space just to connect workers with employers. Okay. And so what kind of skills would an employer look for at the day worker center on a regular basis? Pretty much gardening and labor. So for the men, women is house cleaning, babysitter, but this painting also moving is one of the big ones okay. at the center, yes. And so how does a person engage someone from the day worker center? Does that go through you? Is there paperwork? What happens? Yeah, employers and workers need to register with us. It's really simple. Also, the employers can do it online going to our web address uh, dayworkercentermv.org okay. and they can fill the application form and that really really expedite the process for us okay. that, but the way is really simple it's really quick okay and so um, tell us where they can so that's the website where's the address for people to reach out to you if they want to stop by and ask more questions the, our physical location is 113 Escuela Avenue okay. we are the last building on Escuela okay and the more beautiful okay great and so is there anything else that you'd like us to know about the center and about the minute we have left well this is a wonderful opportunity for people just engage with a wonderful cause really important cause in our community okay. they can get and volunteer their time they can donate their talents 
their time and their money, of course. We are a non-profit organization relying on wonderful and generosity of the people. Okay, well thank you very much for sharing a little bit about the center and what you're doing. At this point, we're going to go back to Teresa at the booth in the middle of the fair. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Welcome back. I'm here with Phil Lenahan, who's the executive producer at The Better Part. Welcome, Phil. Well, oh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be part of this KMPT family. Yeah, it's great to have you on this very sunny day. So, could you tell me a little bit more about Cupertino TV Productions and The Better Part? Cupertino TV Productions is like a club or a class at the Cupertino Senior Center. We're spotted, sponsored by the city, and the city provides us with the KMPT studio to make our shows. Uh, we're all senior citizens, no, ex no previous experience required, you learn on the job and through the four Wednesday nights at KMBT. And um, it's great fun, we're on our 1,091st show next Saturday. Well, congratulations, that's quite a milestone. Yes, and we've covered, I have the list on the website, and I don't think there's a subject that we haven't covered cover every medical, real estate, anything you can think of, we've covered, but any member can suggest a subject. And then we usually agree if it makes sense or it's not politically correct, it's real. Uh, and then we go to do it. So we're self-contained in ourselves when we come to KMBT. As in KMBT, you can also come to be an independent, taking their course and taking their production course, and you can make programs at KMBT. But we are able to bring in our own crew every time. For us, it's, it's consistent in what we do. So how many seniors do you currently have participating in the program? How many? Um, our crew for a program is about 12, with some being in the uh, control room, running all the cameras, and running them on the, on the board and running the audio and switching and watching the tape on the time of teleprompter. Then out on the floor, we have camera people and a floor director, and then we have a host and one or maybe numerous guests. When we shoot next weekend uh, for our Christmas show, we'll have 15 guests, but I'm not going to tell you what they do. Okay. <laughs> So, um, I know you mentioned this before, but if you could reiterate for anybody listening who might be interested in joining this program, uh, who, who's, who's welcome to join the program? What are the uh, people who participate like? Right now, membership is through the Cupertino Senior Center, and you have to be over 50, and you need information. Just call the Cupertino Senior Center, and they'll connect you. We're now opened up to uh, taping on Saturdays, so we can get people who work and we can get people who are under 50 and they can just be in our studio crew. Okay. The benefit to them, if they have just taken the course at KMVT, they don't have to wonder, I want to do a show and now I have to go find people. If they join our production group, they get all of us. Well, this sounds like a really great program. Um, what has this meant to you in your retirement? Um, I got in this group at age 74 and I knew nothing about making television programs. And it just awakened me, it made me active, I'm learning new things, I learned video editing which is crazy, mm -hmm. uh, and no experience. I didn't know anything about this when I started. Well, thank you so much Phil, that's all the time we have for today, but thank you very much for joining us and let's head back to the street and for thank you, KMBT. We're speaking with Dean Shapiro of Cutting Edge Design with a beautiful exhibit of Cutting Edge Designs. Please explain. Well, I use slate stone from different parts of the world. I have jade color slate from Koiling area, Koiling, uh, Raja red slate from India, some Mariposa, California slate, which is up near Yosemite, and different slates that I use for different colors um, and making water fountain features, Ikebana flower vases where they, they hold the water in a uh, terracotta saucer with a pin frog. Flowers last at least 30 to 50 percent longer using the pin frog. It uh, keeps the stem open so it wicks more water up into the flower. How often do you have to refill it with water? Depends on the flower. Iris, like a rose, is very thirsty. 
I'm using carnations or spider mums I've used will use maybe one third as much water. So uh, I have a tiny saucer here. I do have to water this each day for an iris. It sucks up a lot of water. It's not much water. But, but as I get larger, and then the, the saucers get a little larger also. Mm -hmm. So that less maintenance of adding water. So, dif so different sizes are for different types of flowers, or you sometimes you just have to add more water? A larger vase would be better for, say, a um, stargazer or a um, um, bird of paradise. Heavier. I wouldn't put that in a smaller one, it could tip it over. So I need weight uh, and larger holes for better, more arranging, uh, more exotic. With the senseis in Ikebana, uh, get very elaborate. Are these real flowers for your exhibit? Oh, yes. I always use fresh cut flowers at all of my shows that I, and festivals. That I do. Oh, they're beautiful. How long have you had this business? I personally took it over in 98. Uh, it has been in business 10 years before that. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, who's still, he was an Oakland fireman, and he started this as a uh, sideline business, and it's evolved. Um, and then he got me involved and got me in, and, and I took it over, and he has two children now, and he's a Mr. Mom kind of guy, still a fireman. I'm doing this, though, since 98. It's evolved more. The uh, designs on the fountains have gotten more elaborate instead of just a two-tiered. we got the three-tiered and a monolith style I do. Again, I'm doing all the work myself. I have had help throughout the years in the past. With, when this, the economy slowed down, I got back to doing it all myself. And I'm happier that way. Better control, product comes out exactly how I, or close to how I envision. Is this your full-time work? It is so beautiful. More than full-time. 30 hours on a weekend to do a show like this. And I'm back in my shop Monday through Thursday uh, for maybe eight or 10 hour days. So that's 70 hours or 80 hours a week I'm doing. Will you be doing any more shows in the area? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Lafayette is in um, two weeks. I'll do that pumpkin, uh, Half Moon Bay Pumpkin Fest. I also, I, San Carlos, I have. So this weekend, I'm nothing next weekend, but then I have six in a row that I'm doing. Excellent. Well, such a beautiful exhibit. I've seen you here before, and thank you so much for speaking with us. You're very welcome. Thank you for... Hi, I'm Diane Sparks. With um, I'm here at the Wine and Arts Festival here in Mountain View, and I'm talking with an artist who makes these so unique birdhouses. Tell us your name. Uh, my name is Brian Isles. Uh -huh. I'm uh, from Ben Lomond, California. I uh, live on 48 acres out in the woods. Um, my birdhouses have been inspired. Um, I used to be a special ed school teacher, and uh, I've always thought about people's uniqueness and individuality. And so, if you notice, my birdhouses are all one of a kind. And uh, the biggest thrill is when somebody says, "Oh, yeah, I, I bought that birdhouse from my mom, and she really loved it, and it's just really neat." And so, I do this because of the feelings. Um, it makes me feel good, and I and I try to make. Uh, nice, cute birdhouses that uh, cheer people up, and uh, I've been having a good time doing this for five years. I think I've made about 1,200, and they've all been one of a kind. So, so it's for the people to enjoy as well as the birds. Yes. So it's twofold. I it's love twofold. it. Yeah, they're functional. I mean, they're functional birdhouses, but it's garden art. You know, yeah. it's. I notice. You know, a lot of people are broke these days, and. And so they're they're putting money into their yards and into decorating their homes. And so I just hope that this makes somebody feel a little better. Love it. Do you have a website? No. Okay. I do it because I like the individual contact with yeah, people. Yeah. So you come to the art festivals yeah. and show your things and uh, enjoy people appreciating your work. Yeah. 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 It's a fun way to live. Do you do consignment work? Uh, yeah, I did uh, one uh, one consignment job. I did. I this woman said it was for her mother-in-law, and uh, she was from England. She had her tea at three o'clock every day, and she loved to read. So it had an English teacup on top with bird seed. Had a little clock set to three, and uh, I I made a crossword puzzle with some of the books that she said. And one of the things that she said was when she gave it to her, her mother-in-law gave her a hug, and she said that doesn't sound very big, but I've been married to her son for 10 years and she's never hugged me. So the birdhouse made a difference. So.
I just love how you incorporated that idea just from a little bit of information and you went with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you so much for talking with me. All right, you're welcome. All right, bye. Welcome back to CAMVT's live coverage of the 2013 Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. We're reunited, back on the same set at the same time. I'm Chris Pareja, this is Teresa Condon, and we're joined by an unexpected guest, Jim Tu, who's a producer of a couple of shows at CAMVT, and we wanted to get some of the insight of what it's like behind the scenes to make these shows happen, Jim. Well, you know, I First mean... First of all, tell us, what, tell us what you produce. Well, I produce uh, The Right Side, uh, which is a, a political show, and who's, you know, the host of the show, I hear he's a jerk, but yeah, but I work with him, you know. And then I also produce What the Bleep, uh, which I also host, which is a, which is my uh, which is my homage to crazy TV, I guess. But uh, it's it's always it's a very labor intensive, but it's a labor of great, but it's a labor of love. Well, I mean, a lot of people there's a mystique around TV, and CanVT provides a great resource for people who want to dip their toe in the water or learn in a less abusive kind of environment. Talk to us a little bit about the experience and how you caught the bug and why you continue to do it. Well, um, I actually had an idea. I was just kind of watching a lot of TV. I saw a TV show which inspired me to do it, to, to do a TV show. I figured, hey, they, they all have the same stories I do. So I started investigating, and then I came over to KMBT, took the class, uh, produ you know, they produce production class and the producer's class. Um, it's, very, it's very straightforward. They're very, it's very hands-on. It's very friendly. And then afterwards, it just, it, you know, the, the secret product is learning how to deal with people because everyone's a volunteer. So, you know, you got to be nice to people, and they'll produce, they'll, they'll work with you. If you're not nice to people, you don't get through. Well, oh, and volunteers respond well to pizza. Are there other items that they will show up for? Oh yeah, donuts, donuts in the morning, right? <laughs> and uh, donuts and false con and, and, and fake praise. Great job, Chris. <laughs> oh, well, I, I appreciate that. I think. <laughs> You've been exposed to Jim and his wrath as a producer and or host. What's he like to deal with? <laughs> but, no comment. <laughs> but he's very conscientious about bringing us in with the Krispy Kreme donuts. So that's what keeps me coming back. Yeah, so I mean, it, that's affirmation. Donuts yes. work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think if you, can, if you can make producing a TV show fun, you'll have no problem. And as long as you enjoy the experience, People will, people will come, and I think there are benefits because, again, you know, I mean, before I came over to KMBT, you know, I wasn't that really involved in the community, but since I've been volunteering for KMBT, I've got to meet the mayor, you know, in a non-police arrest setting, so that's always a good thing, and you get to see all the booths at, that are out here, because otherwise I'd be shut in at home watching football being cranky on the web. So there's always many positive, positive you know, side benefits of, of volunteering in KMBT. So, Jim, as someone who has participated in a few of your shows, I've always been curious, how do you come up with the content for your shows? Where do you get your ideas from? Well, I, I'm a news junkie on the internet, so every, every time and then I find weird stuff, I just kind of post them, and the same thing with the weird videos and whatever, whatever floats my craziness. Great. Well, thank you very much for speaking with us, Jim, and now let's cut to a performance by the House Rockers Band. Mountain View is here. Mountain View is here. Let's go back to the 80s for one. In excess.
Welcome back to the live coverage of KMVT's coverage of the Mountain View Art and Wine Festival for 2013. We're back together again, Chris, Teresa, as well as Shelly. And like public uh, broadcasting, public access means we need your help to continue to bring the programming and the resources that KMVT needs. And we wanted to spend a couple more minutes with Shelly finding out how can people give money, where will it go, how fast can they get it to us? <laughs> Today. <laughs> yes, uh, we have lots of opportunities for people to be able to support us. So uh, we have a Go Digital Capital campaign. That money, if you dedicate that money, goes directly to upgrading our equipment. As I mentioned earlier, we have to upgrade our current cameras. Um, they're still an analog standard definition. We want to make them high definition. So that's where we're big focus is right now. But also sustainability, as you mentioned. We are a nonprofit, and by being a nonprofit, that means that we are always looking for money to support and sustain our programs. We've got great youth programs that go on. We've got an after-school program called Mountain View Youth Voices that needs um, support. We've got a sports program. We shoot over 100 sporting events in this town each week, uh, or I'm sorry, each year. Um, and with that, we can support that program so businesses can actually do underwriting as well. So it's not just the individual we're asking for money, but we're looking for businesses for support. Um, in January, we're starting a new program called Project Connect. We just received a grant to buy some equipment to actually do some ESL training and provide digital literacy classes. So we'll be teaching basics of how to use computers, and then from there, they'll learn how to uh, do video production as well. So. so since there are youth programs, we can do the Jerry Lewis thing and say, do it for the kids. Do it right? for the kids, that's right. <laughs> do it for the kids, do it for the veterans, do it for the seniors, do it for your community. This is your channel. 
So it's get involved today, support it, $1, $5, $10,000. We can use it and put it to good use. You can make it donatable to kmbt15.org. And uh, we're right on our website. You can call us or you can stop by our booth. We're on the street of Castro and Church. And uh, we can swipe your card today or we'll take cash or check. So. Yeah, I saw you're technologically equipped to take the money right now, however yes, they want to give it to you. Yes, absolutely. So we've been blessed with the little Intuit swiper. So, uh, you know, we're able to take your money today and, uh, and get it rolling. So it'll go to good use. So we're a staff. Everything's volunteer. So, again, it's a write-off for you as an individual. And uh, it's Horrible. a great opportunity to support, support your community. Great. Well, thank you so much, Shelley. This is really great, and hopefully some of you out there listening are ready to walk up to our booth right now and donate. And let's take this back to the streets for a few more interviews and see how the festival's going. And donate today. Hi, I'm Diane Sparks. We're at the Wine and Arts Festival here in Mountain View, and I have an artist with me who makes these very, very cute puppets. Um, tell me your name and... Talk about your work, please. Okay, sure. My name is Cherise Holsom, and my company is called Findle Productions, Inc., and I am the sole creator um, and uh, puppet builder for the company. And what I sell here is professional arm rod puppets, and we have various kinds. I've been making puppets now for about 10 years, and I've been selling them for four years, and this is, I think, my third year at this fair. Okay, so I see you make cute little clothes. Well, do you don't make the clothes. You probably the clothes I do not make. Uh, some of them I do not make, but the puppets I do make. And so I love how you have a heart in most of the mouth. It's so yes. cute. Yes, yeah, so the thing about the heart is I just try to uh, convey love with the puppets because I call this a smile booth, and a lot of people come here, and it, the puppets generate smiles, and the hearts demonstrate love or generate love. I bet your... Uh, are, I bet these guys go to like schools and hospitals. Do you know where people use use your puppets? Yeah, well, predominantly uh, a lot of my uh, client base are teachers, uh, therapists, uh, entertainers, and public speakers, uh, and also um, you know attorneys. <laughs> no way! Tell me about that. Well, I'm a legal secretary <laughs> in the day, and so uh, the. Uh, attorneys at my job do use them uh, for different reasons. Probably to relax their clients. Like, okay, this isn't all that serious. We're going to depose you, but, you know. <laughs> well, we actually use them to um, to make, uh, we we make puppets. We have a puppet, a puppet making activity where we use, we, the attorneys there make the puppets and we raise funds for the San Francisco Food Bank. Oh my gosh, so, yeah, that's a fantastic idea in the office yeah fantastic idea so you do a fundraiser with it yeah and the saxophone guy wait here. yes oh thank you uh, so yeah he's one of the popular puppets uh, my other puppet most popular puppet is a chef puppet oh. and he's popular and for that reason he's not on display because he's constantly being sold and so yeah so this is our saxophone uh, puppet. Most of the, I tour all the, the art and wine and jazz festival circuits and so sometimes I bring the jazz puppet or the saxophonist um, to the jazz puppet, to the jazz festivals. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for oh, talking you. with me. I love, thank they're you. so, so cute. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome back to the end of our live coverage from KMVT for the 2013 Mountain View Art and Wine Festival. I've been your host, Chris Parejan. Teresa Condon has done a great job helping to balance things out and helping make this as smooth as possible with all of the, the interviews that we've had. Uh, any uh, closing thoughts? Well, as, as, the, as the interviews have gone on, we've been talking to a lot of really interesting people involved in many different programs, including the uh, quite a few at the Mountain View Community Television Station. And we last talked to Shelley, Shelley Wolf, who is telling us the many ways you can donate to the station. So feel free to stop by and do that. I believe the festival runs until 6 p.m., if I'm correct. There's a lot of great music and food still left so if you haven't stopped by yet be sure to do so and they're pouring wine until 5 45 according to most of the signs i've seen so people yes. can still come and do some tasting yes. or more than tasting if that's what's yeah a little 
hopefully generous tastings. Yeah. yeah. You have to make sure you get the full flavor out of the experience. Oh, yes, yes. So there's still some shopping to do, some, yes. some vendors to support, but also, as Shelly mentioned, and as you were alluding to, if people can support KMVT, that's a great thing to do as well. Yes. So. And they can find out more information at kmvt15.org if uh, they would like to donate or, again, stop by here at the booth and we can take cash, check, or charge. Great. At well, um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for joining us. So proud.